looked me in the eye and he said, it is okay. It is okay if I die because it is my job and I'm ready for it. But you are a hero. And if you were to die, it would be a great loss for our country. I was taken aback. <clears throat> How can this man <coughs> value his life less than mine? His sincerity was overwhelming. I felt humbled. This is the passion that cricket and cricketers evoke in Sri Lankans. This is the love that I strive every day of my career to be worthy of. Coming back to our cricket, the World Cup also brought less welcome changes with the start of detrimental cricket board politics and the transformation of our cricket administration from a volunteer-led organization run by well-meaning men of integrity into a multi-million dollar organization that has been in turmoil ever since. In Sri Lanka, cricket and politics have been synonymous. The efforts of the Honorable Garmini Desanayaka were instrumental in getting Sri Lanka test status. He was also instrumental in building Asgiria, the international cricket stadium in Kandy. In the infancy of our cricket, it was impossible to sustain the game without state patronage and funding. <clears throat> when Australia and West Indies refused to come to our country for the World Cup, it was through government channels that the combined World Friendship Eleven came and played in Colombo to show the world that it was safe to play cricket there. The importance of cricket to our society also meant that at all times it enjoys benevolent state patronage. For Sri Lanka to be able to select a national team, it must have membership of the sports ministry. No team can be fielded without the final approval of the sports minister. It is indeed a unique system where the board appointed selectors at any time can be overruled and asked to reselect a side already chosen. <coughs> the sports minister can also exercise his unique powers to dissolve the cricket board if investigations reveal corruption or financial irregularity. With the victory in 1996 came power and money to the board and players. Players from within the team itself became involved in power games. Officials elected to power in this way, in turn, manipulated player loyalty to achieve their own ends. At times, board politics would spill over into the team, causing rift, ill feeling, and distrust. The only shining example to the contrary I can remember was the interim committee headed by Mr. Vijay Mallasekara, who is sitting here today in the audience. <coughs> Accountability and transparency in administration and credibility of conduct were lost in a mad power struggle that would leave Sri Lankan cricket with no consistent and clear administration Presidents and elected executive committees would come and go. Government picked interim committees would be appointed and dissolved. After 1996, the cricket board has been controlled and administered by a handful of well-meaning individuals, either personally or by proxy, rotated in and out depending on appointment or election. Unfortunately, to consolidate and perpetuate their powers, they opened the door of the administration to partisan cronies that would lead to corruption and wanton waste of cricket board finances and resources. It was and still is confusing. Accusations of vote buying and rigging, player interference due to lobbying from each side, and even violence at the AGMs, including the brandishing of weapons and ugly fistfights, have characterized cricket board elections for as long as I can remember. The team lost the buffer between itself and the cricket administration. Players had become used to approaching members in power, directly trading favors for mutual benefits. And by 1999, <coughs> all these changes in administration and player attitudes had transformed what was a close-knit unit in 1996 into a collection of individuals with no shared vision or sense of team. 
The World Cup that followed in England was a debacle, a first round exit. Fortunately though, this proved to be the catalyst for further change within the dynamics of the Sri Lankan team. <clears throat> a new mix of players, a nice blend of youth and experience, provided the context in which the old hierarchical systems and structures within the team were dismantled, and in the decade that followed under the more consensual leadership of Sanat, Marvan, and Mahela, the team continued to grow. In the new team culture forged since 1999, individuals are accepted. The only thing that matters is commitment and discipline to the team. Individuality and internal debate are welcome. Respect is not demanded but earned. There was a new commitment towards keeping the team safe <clears throat> from board turmoil. It has been difficult <clears throat> to fully exclude it from our team because there are constant efforts to drag us back in and in times of weakness and doubt, players have crossed the line. Still, we have managed to protect and motivate our collective efforts towards one goal, winning on the field. We have to aspire to better administration. The administrators needs, need to adopt the same values enshrined by the team over the years. Integrity, transparency, commitment, and discipline. Unless the administration is capable of becoming more professional, forward-thinking, and transparent, then we risk alienating the common man. Indeed, this is already happening. <coughs> Loyal fans are becoming increasingly disillusioned. This is a very dangerous thing, because it is not the administrators or players that sustain the game. It is the cricket-loving public. It is their passion that powers cricket, and if they turn their backs on cricket, then the whole system will come crashing down. The solution to this may be the ICC taking a stand to suspend member boards with any direct detrimental political interference and allegations of corruption and mismanagement. This will negate the ability of those boards to field representative teams or receive funding and other accompanying benefits from the ICC. But as a Sri Lankan, I hope we have the strength to find the answers ourselves. While the team structure and culture itself was slowly evolving, our on-field success was primarily driven by the sheer talent and spirit of uniquely talented players unearthed in recent times. Players like Murali Sanat, Aravinda, Mahela, and Lasit Malinga. Although our school cricket structure is extremely strong, our club structure remains archaic. With players diluted among 20 clubs, it does not enable the national coaching staff to easily identify and funnel talented players through for further development. The lack of competitiveness of the club tournament does not lend itself to producing hardened first-class professionals. Various attempts to change this structure, to condense and improve have been resisted by the administration and the clubs concerned. <clears throat> the main reason for this being that any elected cricket board that offended these clubs runs the risk of losing their votes come election time. At the same time, the instability of our administration is a huge stumbling block to the rapid phase change that we need. Indeed, it is amazing that the, despite this system, <coughs> we are able to produce so many world-class cricketers. Nevertheless, despite abundant natural talent, we need to change our cricketing structure. We need to be more Sri Lankan rather than selfish. We need to condense our cricketing structure to ensure that the best players are playing against each other at all times. We need to do this with an open mind allowing both innovative thinking and free expression. In some, reasons, in some respects, we are doing that already, especially our coaching department, which is actively searching for unorthodox talent. We have recognized and learned that our cricket is stronger when it is free-spirited, and we therefore encourage players to express themselves and be open to innovation. 
There was a recent case where the national coaches were tipped off <clears throat> to the case of a six-foot-tall volleyball player. He apparently, when viewed by the district coach of the region, ambles up to the wicket off about four steps, jumps four to five feet high in the air in a, in a smash-like leap, and delivers the ball while in midair. His feet are within the two ball increases, the popping and the ball increase, but after his delivery, he lands quite a ways down the wicket. <laughs> now the district coach found this <clears throat> very, very interesting and unique. So he thought, well, let's have, a, let's have a trial. So he takes a video camera along and gets this volleyball player who has never bowled before for any lengthy period to bowl for half an hour in the district nets. He does quite a good job, half an hour of jumping high and delivering a cricket ball quite well with good direction and the video sample is then sent back to our cricket board. The national coaches there also find it interesting and they say, well, let's call him to Colombo for a trial. Four days later, they make a call. And the volleyball player answers the phone call from a hospital bed. And when invited, he says, oh, I'm sorry, I can't move. I've never bowled for 30 minutes. I strained my back. <laughs> so the search for gold in that, instant, in that particular instance did not come to fruition. There was another case where there was a letter postmarked from a, a, a distant village where the writer claimed to be the fastest undiscovered bowler in Sri Lanka. Upon further inquiry, it was found that the letter was written by a teenage Buddhist monk who proceeded to give a bowling demonstration dressed in his flowing saffron robes. In Sri Lanka, cricket tempts even the most chaste and holy. <laughs> if we are able to seize the moment, then the future of Sri Lanka's cricket remains very bright. I pray we do because cricket <clears throat> has such an important role to play in our island's future. Cricket played a crucial role during the dark days of Sri Lanka's civil war, a period of enormous suffering for all communities. But the conduct and performance of the team will have even greater importance as we enter a crucial period of reconciliation and recovery. An exciting period where all Sri Lankans aspire to peace and unity. It is also an exciting period for cricket where the reintegration of isolated communities in the north and the east open up new talent pools. The spirit of cricket can and should remain the guiding force for good within our society, providing entertainment and fun, but also a shining example to all of how we should approach our lives. The war is now over. Sri Lanka looks towards a new future of peace and prosperity. I am eternally grateful for this. It means that my children will grow up without war and violence being a daily part of their lives. They will learn of its horrors, not firsthand, but perhaps in history class or through conversation. For it is important that they understand and appreciate the great and terrible price our country and our people paid for the freedom and security they now enjoy. In our cricket, we display a unique spirit. A spirit enriched by lessons learned from a history spanning over two and a half millennia. In our cricket, you see the character of our people. Our history, culture, tradition, our laughter, our joy, our tears, our regrets, and our hopes. It is rich in emotion and talent. 
My responsibility as a Sri Lankan 